This video is brought to you by Raycon. When it comes to releasing movies, there is the occasional box office bomb. Mars Needs Moms, Osmosis Jones, The Black Cauldron, to name a few. And for whatever reasons, these films just couldn't turn a strong enough profit. Now, for most big studios, such as Disney, they can just take the hit and move on to their next project. But there was one movie that was such a disaster, such a colossal failure, that it would lead to the closure of Fox Animation Studios. And that movie? Titan A.E. Now, I can only imagine that some of you right now are going, oh yeah, that movie, that early 2000s 2D, 3D animated sci-fi film about an edgy boy with daddy issues who goes on a quest to find a hidden secret world. Well, you're not wrong. Despite the similarities to Treasure Planet, there are quite a few things about Titan AE that make it stand out as a film. First off, this would be the final movie that Don Bluth would ever direct. For those who don't know, Don Bluth was the guy behind The Land Before Time, Anastasia, and The Secret of Nim, and was one of the first people to ever truly challenge Disney's supremacy when it came to animated films. Next, Titan AE was a very ambitious project, with what it was trying to do utilizing the animation medium. Funny enough, it wasn't even supposed to be animated to begin with, but was eventually tossed over to Don Bluth and Fox Animation Studios, because it just wasn't working out as a live-action film. Fox was like, uh, use 3D animation and make it appealing to those nerdy kids who like Star Wars. Clearly, it did not work. And last but not least, Titan AE was a financial disaster. Between the production and marketing cost, it's estimated that the film lost over $100 million for Fox, and was the main reason why they would go on to close the doors at Fox Animation Studios. Like, I know a lot of movies that have bombed at the box office, but to the point of closing down your own studio? <laughs> Ouch. But that being said, how does the movie hold up nowadays? Is it possible that Titan AE was just some unfortunate victim of poor decision-making by Fox? Or is it actually kind of bad and deserves to be a failure? Well, let's take a closer look. Cause it's my time to fly, yeah, yeah, butt rock. <laughs> So, how did Titan AE, this animated hot mess, even come to be? Well, like I said, it wasn't even supposed to be animated to begin with. Back in 1998, 20th Century Fox was developing Titan AE, but they weren't quite sure what they were doing with it. The idea was passed around by multiple writers, such as Bed Edlund, Joss Whedon, Art Vitello, and John August. I mean, Titan burned through $30 million before it was even decided to make it an animated movie. According to my sources, the chairman for Fox at the time, Bill Mechanic, was like, uh, I don't know what to do with this project. Uh, just give it to our animation department so we don't have to fire them all. What? What's that? They never worked on a sci-fi film before? It's easy. Just make it like Star Wars or something. Here, here's $75 million. Make it happen. So it was clear that Fox was confused on this one and wasn't quite sure what it was doing. Up to this point, Fox Animation was trying to catch up with Disney and their line of successful 2D animated movies from the 90s. Now, Fox was able to find some kind of momentum with the success of Anastasia in 97. But the landscape of animation was rapidly changing around this time, due to the arrival of Pixar and 3D animation. Also, Disney had fallen on its face and wasn't as successful with its 2D animated films as it once was. And on top of that, there was this notion that teens wanted something more spicy with their content. More action. More drama. Not a bunch of Disney princesses singing songs. So yeah, uh, animation was kind of in disarray during the late 90s, and folks weren't quite sure which direction to go in. So why not both? 
Let's combine traditional 2D animation with trendy 3D animation. Also, let's make the story more dark and brooding. And you know what? Hey, let's bring on that Don Bluth guy to head the project. I mean, if there was anyone who can throw down with Disney, it's this guy. This would actually be the first 3D animated movie that Don Bluth ever worked on. And up to this point, uh, Homeboy here only worked in traditional animation, so this was uncharted territory for him. I mean, what could go wrong? Turns out, a lot. There's a quote from John August, one of the screenwriters for the movie, where he said, quote, even over the four to six weeks that I was on board for the project, we went from being all traditional animation to completely CG, sort of like Ice Age animation, to the hybrid that it became." End quote. He also got notes about how the characters could be underwater, but they couldn't be wet. Hollywood producers, ladies and gentlemen, they absolutely suck. Yeah, we want the characters in space, but uh, don't make them look like they're floating in space. That's a bit gay. Why? <laughs> I don't know. It's what the kids want. The kids don't want gay people floating in space? Listen, I don't make up the rules. Yes, you do. Y yes, you do. So the production of Titan AE would prove to be incredibly difficult. Over 300 people from the animation staff would be let go before the movie was even released and a large portion of the film was dependent on outsourcing from other studios. As a matter of fact, Blue Sky Studios, rest in peace, which would eventually be acquired by Fox, and then bought by Disney, and then let go by Disney, well, it worked on the genesis portion of this movie. After 19 months of production, Titan AE was completed, and things were looking rough. Bill Mechanic, the guy who was the chairman of Fox, was fired from Fox, and this was the guy who set everything into motion for Titan. So, uh, yeah, not a good sign. And in June of 2000, Titan AE made its debut and was released in over 2,700 theaters worldwide. And it was a financial disaster. It made less than $10 million its opening weekend and would go on to only make $36 million during its entire theatrical run. So when you take into consideration the production cost and the marketing cost of the film, well, you have a movie that lost over $100 million for Fox, making it one of the worst performing animated movies in history. Audiences just didn't care. They did not want to watch it. They'd rather go check out DreamWorks or Pixar. Not this hot mess. And after 10 days following its release, Fox Animation Studios was closed. This was also the final movie that Don Bluth ever worked on, effectively concluding his cinematic career. Now, there's no denying that Fox took a leap of faith with Titan AE, both with the story and the animation. They went into uncharted territory, but they never had a strong leader with a clear vision in command. And that's why Titan was one of the greatest animation failures of all time. But don't worry, folks, we had two sequels, Attack on Titan and Remember the Titans. So it wasn't a complete loss. <laughs> Shut up, I'm funny. So what's Titan AE about? Well, fast forward a thousand years from now, plus like seven years on top of that, and humanity has become a spacefaring race. According to the movie, humans are making a ton of progress. There are even rumors about this one project called Titan, and how it's gonna put humanity on top in the galaxy. Sweet, right? Well, this one species called the Dredge, which are like an energy-based species that are a combination of the aliens from Independence Day and the Protoss from StarCraft, well, they want to be in charge. So they blow up Earth right at the very start. Kind of a cool premise, right? Yeah. Before the Earth goes boom, Ron Perlman, whose character's name I can't recall, so I'm just gonna call him Ron Perlman, well, Ron Perlman tells his son, named Kale, <laughs> son, daddy has to fly this ship away so the dredge can't find it. I'm gonna give you to Uncle Alien now. So here's a ring, gotta go, bye son. Fast forward 15 years later, and Kale is working on some alien space station. We learn that the humans who did survive the destruction of Earth 
are scattered across the galaxy and also face a lot of prejudice from other aliens. We're just a bunch of worthless drifters in the void of space. For Kale, well, he's bored. He's tired of rotting away on this space station. But lucky for him, adventure finds him. Some guy named Corso, who was a friend of Ron Perlman, shows up and tells Kale that his ring is actually a map that reveals where the Titan is. So off Kale goes with Corso and his spaceship crew. Stith, the weapon specialist. Goon, the ugly nerd. Nathan Lane, the Nathan Lane. And then Akima, the human girl. They then travel to some planet with a bunch of old bat guys who can decipher the map and locate the Titan. It's funny cause uh, they don't even know what the Titan can do. They just go, we gotta find it cause it's gotta be important. Important enough for Ron Perlman to die for it. The dredge then show up and attack the crew. These two get captured, the dredge find out where the Titan is located, and then Akima and Kale break free and reunite with the rest of the crew. But oh no, betrayal. As they overhear Corso talking to the haughty dredge queen and how he's in cahoots with her. Probably cause he wants to bang her hot blue energy orbs. I mean, come on guys, check out that thigh gap. Wouldn't you betray the human race to get a piece of that lightning blue action? I would. <laughs> it then becomes a race as Akima and Kale try to beat the rest of the crew to the Titan. They get there first and then discover that the Titan is a ship that has the capability of creating another Earth. It's kind of like a Noah's Ark in a way. Corso shows up and holds a gun up to Akima and Kale. Then Corso gets betrayed by Nathan Lane, but then the dreads show up. And a uh, meh space battle ensues. Uh, but hey, check it out. Nathan Lane dies by getting his neck snapped. Bet you won't see that in The Lion King. <laughs> Choking, not breathing. <laughs> Kale then goes, ah, man, we got to power the ship. How do we do that? Wait, the dredge. They're beings of pure energy. What if, and follow me here, what if we ask them to jump our car? <laughs> right? Simple as that. Uh, so Kale figures out, hey, let's just use the dredge and absorb their energy bodies into the Titan. It works. Uh, the Titan AE is rejuvenated and it creates a new planet Earth. And I gotta be real, guys. It looks pretty rough. <laughs> Doesn't look as good as the first one. This one looks like it's out of an early 2000s video game cutscene. Wait, when was this movie made? And that's the movie! So, Kale, let us go home and unpack your emotional cabbage. <laughs> oh, I'm the funniest guy on the planet. Not that planet, that planet sucks. So, what are my overall thoughts about Titan AE? Oh, by the way, the AE stands for After Earth, so, you know, in case you were wondering. Uh, well, let's start off with the story. Honestly, kind of boring. Despite being the incredibly ambitious and daring project that it was, I never clicked with the plot of the movie, which is like super bizarre to me. Like all of the ingredients seem to be there for an engaging movie. Alien space battles, an epic quest with dark undertones, the literal destruction of Earth. These are bold strokes for a mainstream animated movie. Yet the story never pulled me in. I think a big part of that is due to how unlikable the characters are. None of them were appealing to me. Like Stiff and Goon were kind of okay, but everybody else bored me. Kale was a whiny, edgy boy. Akima was a sassy, generic love interest. And then Corso just flat out confused me. We, we, we gotta save the Titan. Just kidding. Uh, I want to get paid. Wait, no, never mind. I want to save humanity again. <laughs> what? Where did that change of heart come from? It came out of nowhere. Like, compare this to Silver's Betrayal and Treasure Planet. Sorry, Titan AE. I gotta compare you to your better older brother. Wait, what, which one came out first? Whatever. So, in Treasure Planet, in that movie, the story was building up to that moment so it felt more impactful and rewarding. Silver betraying the crew. Silver betraying Jim Hawkins. The guy who he thought was like a father betrayed him. That was very heavy. But here, 
it was way too sudden. And there wasn't enough time with Kale and Corso becoming like father and son. It's like, yeah, you can fly my ship, I guess. That's kind of cool. Okay, get out of the driver's seat. I'm driving. Also, it's really funny how Kale and Akima found out about Corso's betrayal. They were like walking down the hallway and Corso's room had its door open and he was FaceTiming the Dredge Queen and he was screaming like, that wasn't part of the deal. When I betrayed the earth and my team and my crew as I scream it out loud with my door open. Dude, really? You, you, you fly a spaceship. Shouldn't you know about locking your doors when screaming about your nefarious plots? Th that really bothered me. Also, uh, speaking of being let down, the dredge. I was expecting something more sinister from them. Oh, they fear humanity. Okay, sure. That's fine. Why? Ah, because humans might outpace them. Okay, okay, sweet. Let's build on that. Uh, oh, we don't. They're just evil blue aliens, and that's it. No personality, no clear direction, just we hate humans, and that's it. Maybe the intro could have better established a tenuous relationship between humanity and the Dredge, that we're like at war with them, and the Dredge finally found Earth, and it would be the last time they would ever have to deal with humanity, and that the Titan was the last hope for humanity. That would have been much more interesting to me. Versus the dreads just getting jealous about humanity because we made a giant golden ball that can shoot dolphin DNA. You know what? That is kind of cool, the more I think about it. Yeah, I blow up Earth too. So, in summary, I'd say that the story lacked direction. It was aimless. It was unclear. And it was very difficult for me to connect with any of the characters and their challenges. Now, compare this to The Secret of Nim, one of Don Bluth's greatest movies. I genuinely felt for Miss Brisby and her plight. She had to overcome so much in order to save her family from dying. And that really spoke to me. For Titan AE? <laughs> I don't care. They could have done something with Kale lacking a father and needing direction in life. And maybe compare that to humanity needing direction in life. The micro, the macro, something about needing guidance. That could have worked. But no, the movie kind of alludes to it, but never really drills down into it. In my opinion, that's lost potential. That all being said though, I do like a few things about the setting and the story. For example, the prejudice that humanity faces after losing Earth was interesting to me. We're scattered species now with no home and aliens mock us for it. I like that, but the movie only lightly touches on that and then moves on with finding the Titan with this stupid go find the thing quest. It would have been much cooler if there was a spaceport where it shows a bunch of humans being treated like second class citizens or being enslaved by aliens or something. Make me feel sad for humanity's downfall and why it's worth fighting for our species to reclaim its home. We don't get enough of that in the movie, in my opinion. Okay, let's talk about the voice acting. It was fine. Solid performances from some A-listers. You got Matt Damon, Bill Pullman, Drew Barrymore, Nathan Lane. Oh gosh, I'm gonna screw your name up. John Leguizamos. Leguizamo. It was fine. Nothing amazing, but it was competent. Now, to be fair, I don't think any of the characters had particularly amazing lines to work with. So take that for what it's worth. Oh, and the music. <laughs> Guys, we got Creed in the trailer. Oh yeah. And uh, a variety of other butt rock bands helping with the soundtrack of the film. It's my time to fly. It's my time cause I'm still here and I'm over my head, over my head. <laughs> oh my God. I miss the early 2000s, and yet I can't hate it more. <laughs> I hate it. What happened to us during those years? And finally, there's the animation. So to me, this is the most interesting part of the entire film, and is also probably why you would want to check it out at least once. Like I've already said, Titan AE uses a blend of 2D and 3D animation. The spaceships, the dredge, uh, the planets, those are all 3D animated, 
and were relatively cutting edge at the time of its creation. I mean, just look at that Earth. Wow. Th this is impressive. If it was 20 years ago. <laughs> The main characters, on the other hand, were 2D animated. And you better believe we got that trademark Don Bluth lip thing going on. You know what I'm talking about? Where his little lip, lip circle thing going on. Don, that's weird. What is that about? And yet, I like it. So the entire film was this experimental blend of 2D and 3D animation. And yeah, it has not aged well. Now, I do admire the attempt and how they wanted to push 3D animation along with traditional, but it just doesn't work. Again, look at the texture of the ground on Earth 2.0. That looks really bad. Also, the lighting and the color in this movie feel so lackluster to me. It's very dimly lit and comes across as bleh on a visual level, and I guess a story level too. <laughs> Now, to be fair, this was Don Bluth's first time working with 3D animation, so I could only imagine there was a learning curve here. Also, 3D animation was still relatively new at the time, so to try and incorporate it on such a level was very bold. Let me just say that any complaints that I have about the visuals of this movie are not due to a lack of trying from the staff. This was a genuine attempt that failed, and that's unfortunate. All right, let's talk about the character designs. Kale, Corso, Akima, they were fine. Nothing particularly special, but nothing terrible by any means. But I think where Don Bluth and his character designs shine the most are with fictional creatures. And we get that with the 2D aliens of this movie. Stith, Goon, Preed, some of the background aliens. They have really creative designs, and I really like their facial expressions. I just wish they had better storytelling to back them up. But how about those dredge? Those off-brand Protoss? Uh, seriously, look! That's pretty uncanny, right? But yeah, they're just blah to me, both with the visuals and the storytelling. Like, on paper, it seems interesting. An alien species made of pure energy? Cool! Oh, what do they look like? Oh, that's that's gonna be hard to get any personality out of, huh? All in all, though, I give mad props to the team behind Titan and what they were trying to accomplish with the tone of the movie, both on a storytelling and visual level, but they were unable to stick the landing. Now, it goes without saying that I believe that animation is the greatest medium when it comes to telling stories and the raw potential of animation. Like, it's amazing that a movie like Titan AE was given the opportunity to be told through 2D and 3D animation. But in all of it, something was missing. Direction, or heart, or, or personality. It desperately needed those things. And I think that's why it ended up failing as hard as it did. To quote a good friend of mine, Titan AE is not a remarkable movie but it's remarkable that it was even made to begin with. So, in conclusion, I have a lot of respect for Titan AE and the team behind it. There's no denying that this was an ambitious project, and it truly wanted to do something different. To mix up 2D animation with computer graphics. To tell a more mature story that isn't just for young children. But Titan AE just had the unfortunate luck of being released around a time when 2D animation was about to be overshadowed by 3D on the cinematic stage. And Fox Animation absolutely paid the price for their bad timing. It also didn't help that Titan AE never had clear direction. To me, it seemed more like they had a general idea of what they desired for their film, but were never able to successfully connect the dots. If anything, they stumbled their way to completion and despite having a competent film, it wasn't nearly enough to save the studio from being shut down. Instead, Fox acquired Blue Sky Studios and then pulled the plug on their own animation department. I mean, why fight progress when you can just buy it, right? I mean, just ask Disney. On top of that, this was the final big movie that Don Bluth would ever work on. It's kind of ironic, really. Titan AE is a movie about bringing back something that was destroyed, 
While the production of Titan AE would lead to the conclusion of Fox Animation Studios and would be the final entry of Don Bluth's cinematic career. A bittersweet farewell for such a big name in animation. So, if you want to watch this hot mess of a movie, go give it a watch. Personally, I don't think it's amazing, and I think a lot of folks who do love it have rose-tinted glasses and are being filled by nostalgia copium, but I do think it's still worth checking out for being such a novelty. I mean, hey, maybe it might even end up on Disney Plus someday and sit awkwardly next to Treasure Planet on the screen. An animated sci-fi failure that costs millions of dollars and features two edgy boys with daddy issues? <laughs> oh, you son of a bitch. Watch out, planet Earth. The dredge are about to blow you up. Oh no, the Earth can't hear me because it's wearing its Raycon earbuds. Yeah, you better believe this is going to be a running gag. So I want to give a big shout out to this video sponsor, Raycon Earbuds. Raycon is disrupting the electronics industry by designing premium wireless audio for half the price and without the compromise. They're doing things differently than the other brands out there, from the way they design their products to the way they price them. Raycon holds true to their customer's experience from start to finish. So for the longest time, I thought that earbuds were dumb, but Raycon made me a believer. Honestly, I use them all the time, while doing tours around the house, while walking my dog, while working out, and real talk, it's nice not having a wire getting caught up in my arms all the time. Raycon earbuds give you six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, a rich bass, and a more compact design for a comfortable, noise-isolating fit. There's even a 45-day free return policy. And best of all, Raycons aren't stupid expensive like other brands. They're fairly priced, but still have a high level of sound quality. I've been rocking their everyday E25s for a while now, and I gotta say, they've been consistently great. This version has 6-hour playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, a rich bass to the sound, and a more compact design that gives you a nice, noise-isolating fit. There are even new colors to pick from. Oh, and by the way, Raycon was founded by Ray J, and celebrities such as Snoop Dogg, Mike Tyson, J.R. Smith are absolutely obsessed with Raycons. So, click the link in the description down below, or go to buyraycon.com slash saberspark to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Again, I legit use these, I use them every morning when I go for my walks, and I really like them, so go check them out. 